all for being here today. Um, it is really a privilege to be here with Boulder Public Library as a part of One Book, One Boulder to bring you a piece of Modus Theater's strategic narrative work. Uh, thank you so much to the Boulder Library Foundation for their generous support of this and many other programs at the Boulder Public Library. I'm Tanya Titus, Modus Theater's National Outreach and Education Director, as well as one of the undocumented monologists in our Undocu America series. Modus Theater's mission is to create original theater to facilitate dialogue on critical issues of our time. And I just want to mention, although we're all joining from the comfort of our homes, today we want to honor that the city of Boulder stands on the land of the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Ute. This evening, we will be sharing four Undocu America monologues that will help us more deeply understand the impact of immigration policy so we can reflect and take action. They were created in a MODIS monologue workshop in collaboration with MODIS's artistic director, Kirsten Wilson. Two of the Undocu monologues featured tonight will be read by award-winning immigration history authors, professors Natalia Molina and Aviva Chomsky. They will model civic hospitality and deep listening by stepping into our monologous shoes and reading aloud our stories. After the performance, they will reflect on the impact of reading these stories and talk specifically about the connection between racism and immigration. You as the audience will have a chance to ask questions of these esteemed historians and the monologist as part of an optional Q&A after the formal presentation. We're also super excited that singer and songwriter Elisa Garcia has chosen short musical responses in between each monologue that she hopes will allow us to feel more fully the sorrows, the hopes, and the dreams of the monologists, as well as our own aspirations for justice. Most of the songs are in Spanish, but we will briefly share on the chat a central lyric or a chorus in English. And without further ado, Let's begin with Armando Peniche. Hello everyone. My name is Armando Peniche and thank you very much for being here today. Um, just a little bit about myself. I am a DACA recipient and I moved here to the US when I was nine years old. So I've been here a long time and I work at the Denver Public Library. So it's pretty cool that Boulder Public Library is doing this. So I'm really proud of that. Um, I am a library program associate for the library. So I do a lot of program, programming with kids, families, and adults. So um, yeah, I do a lot of stuff around the community with those, those groups. And I have a story to share with you tonight. So let's get started. So like many Latinos, I have a huge family, but unfortunately, I never get to see most of them because they're on the other side of the U.S. border with Mexico. My family in the U.S., I can count on my fingers. I have a few uncles, my dad, my brother, and my sisters. But thankfully, I've always been fortunate to have wonderful friends who I see as family. And that's why in the seventh grade, when my dad decided to move us to a different neighborhood, I chose to remain in the same middle school so I could stay with my old friends. And you know, hanging out with my friends during lunch and sitting next to my secret crush in math class seemed like a no brainer, but it made my trip to school to be a long one. But I had my routine down. I'd wake up 5.30 in the morning, catch the first bus at 6.15, arrive at the second bus stop at 6.45 and hope I didn't have to chase after the bus. If I made it to the corner of Kentucky and Federal by 7.15, then I was good. I could take a deep breath because this meant I had time to stop at the convenience store and grab a cup of hot cocoa, maybe play a couple of arcade games before school. If you want to talk about a warm up, I'm winning against hordes of zombies before even starting my school day. Yep, no pop quiz was ever bigger than that. After school, on nice days, I would skip the second bus and just walk. My dad would still be at work when I came home 
and my sister had her after school activities. So I was in no hurry to get to an empty house. On my way home, I would use the concrete dividers on the sidewalk as measures and take the time to practice my music lessons for cello. So each step I made on the sidewalk was a note. So I would count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. For longer sections, I would count one and two and three and four. And for shorter sections, one, two, three, four. I had my music teacher in my head the whole time telling me, come on Armando, stay on the beat, stay on the beat. So one day I'm happily counting along, looking down at my concrete measures when I see blue and red lights flashing across the sidewalk and I hear an angry voice yelling at me, stop, freeze. I was totally confused. I might fight video game zombies, but I was just a kid, barely old enough to sit in the front seat of a car and here are two police officers coming at me, hands on their guns, yelling. I was freaking out, like, what did I do wrong? You know, my mind was going through a mess of different emotions because as an undocumented person, the last thing you wanna do, the very, very, very last thing you wanna do is get into trouble. Even a simple traffic violation could lead to deportation. So I'm thinking, what did I do? What could it have been? Did I forget to pay the bus driver? No way. I remember paying David. He gave me a transfer and he would never call the cops on me even if I did forget. The officers were yelling at me to turn around and put my hands up. And I was struggling to understand what was going on when the second officer physically spun me around, stuck his hands in my pocket and started pulling everything out. My gum, the coins left over from the arcade, my bus transfer, my student ID. He yanked my arms tight behind my back and handcuffed me. I was in shock, totally confused and terrified. And then with some kind of kid logic, I thought, wait, is it my hair? My family didn't have money for regular haircuts back then, so I would cut my own hair, which as you can imagine with a 12 year old, it didn't work out so well. I would always end up using the number four clipper to get rid of the patches. And I was like, okay, at least it's even, but no, I thought it can't be my hair. Then they searched every pocket in my backpack, dumping out my school books. They were looking for something they couldn't find and that's when it hit me. They stopped me because of the color of my skin. They think I'm some kind of criminal and I can't believe they're doing this. What if they take me to jail and my dad has to come get me? Will he need an ID? Could they deport my dad? The officers pushed me down grabbed my student ID and went back to their car, leaving me on this street handcuffed. It took about 20 minutes to run my ID through some database. And while I sat on that curb, all these cars were going by with people looking at me, pointing at me like I stole something or I robbed somebody. They assumed the officers were making the city safer for them, stopping a thief. I'm a kid in handcuffs sitting on the curb and I want to get up and yell, stop, I'm the victim here. I didn't do anything. Let me go. I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. And I can't explain to you even now how humiliated and ashamed I felt sitting there with everyone going by, pointing at me, looking at me, thinking I was some criminal. Finally, the officers came out of their car, threw my stuff in my backpack and uncuffed me. One handed me my ID and said the most ironic thing I've ever heard. Stay out of trouble. No apology, nothing. When all along, 
I was in the trouble, they were. I remember it taking me a long time to pull myself together to even figure out which way was home. But I did make it home. And like many other days, there was no one there. No one I could talk to. Instinctively, I grabbed my soccer ball and went to an elementary school a few blocks away where I often played soccer. There was no field, but there was a baseball cage where I would sometimes practice my shots. I stayed there until evening kicking the soccer ball over and over and over against the metal cage, taking out my anger and my shame on that ball until my foot couldn't take the pain anymore. I often wonder how many other brown and black kids go through this stuff, pulled over, harassed by police with no way to channel their fear, anger, humiliation. How many undocumented kids go through this stuff and have no one at home to talk to, no shoulder to cry on, no soccer ball? Because we start to serve a life sentence away from our families as soon as we cross that border. And I'm a man now, all grown up, watching another man, our president, tell the citizens of this country that if you're an, if you're an undocumented Mexican, you must be in a dangerous gang, a rapist, a murderer. Can I be safe walking home from my job at the library when more and more Americans view people who look like me as a threat? Even more importantly, is my nine-year-old son going to look like a bad guy to a couple of officers? Will my neighbors see me for who I am? A young father hurrying to pick up his son from school so that he doesn't have to walk into an empty house. Or am I their worst nightmare, like some zombie that must be stopped? And this beautiful dark skin you see that people are being thought is a threat to this country is the rich brown tone I inherited from my grandfather. And let me tell you, my grandfather is the best person I've ever known. No matter how poor he was, he would always house and feed people. And before he turned to religion, he was so patriotic that even when the national anthem was played on the radio, he would stand up. And he loved his grandkids so much, he would wake up extra early and walk miles to a place in Mexico that gave out free milk at five in the morning. So despite our poverty, we had what we needed to grow strong. Across that invisible border, my grandfather is the person I've missed the most. And because I'm undocumented, I never got a chance to go back and say goodbye to him. So when you see someone with this beautiful, dark brown skin walking down the street, I hope you think of my strong, kind-hearted Mexican grandfather. And I hope you think of me. And I hope you think of my beautiful son and help me to keep him safe. Thank you. Tú no puedes comprar el viento. Tú no puedes comprar al sol. Tú no puedes comprar la lluvia, tú no puedes comprar el calor, tú no puedes comprar las nubes, tú no puedes comprar los colores, tú no puedes comprar mi alegría, tú no puedes comprar mis dolores, tú no puedes comprar al viento. Tú no puedes comprar al sol, tú no puedes comprar la lluvia, tú no puedes comprar el calor, tú no puedes comprar las nubes, tú no
no puedes comprar los colores, tú no puedes comprar mi alegría, tú no puedes comprar mis dolores. So welcome everybody. I am uh, Viva Chomsky, Professor of History and Latin American Studies at Salem State University in Massachusetts. And I am very honored to be here tonight and getting to listen to some beautiful stories and beautiful music. And I also get to read you a beautiful story. So that is what I'm going to do now. Um, the story I'm going to read you is by Tanya Chaides, who you all just met a couple of minutes ago, and it's called Listen to Your Heart. I often hear that the only way to get people to care about my struggles as an undocumented woman is to ask them to imagine me as their daughter or sister. But I have my own family, and my mere humanity deserves respect. I was taught at school in this country that my contributions to society are all that should matter. So I have done everything in my power to be at the top of my class, to, go to, a, into a, to get into a good college, volunteer, work hard, and pay taxes to prove that I am worthy. And I am worthy with or without all that effort even though I often get treated, quite literally, like an alien or criminal, simply because I don't have an official document calling me a citizen. I also want you to know that I am proud of my Mexican identity, although it took almost two decades for me to embrace it. You see, from ages five to 18, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona a place where an anti-immigrant sheriff named Joe Arpaio ruled. He put undocumented Mexican immigrants in chain gang shackles, making the men wear pink underwear to humiliate them. He literally celebrated spending less money on his inmates than on his dog. And this was somehow acceptable? I grew up constantly striving to prove that I wasn't dirty, lazy, criminal, or shameful, that I wasn't worth less than a dog. I now finally have a sense of my own value. So to feel my life under attack and have most people do nothing in response, it's as if my humanity doesn't matter and that baffles me. It is inconceivable that the very ground under my feet is falling away and I could be deported, put into a detention center, separated from my family, lose my job, my mortgage, and all I've built, while my friends, neighbors, the people at the coffee shop, the grocery store, and you listening to my story don't see my situation as urgent enough to get up and do something about it. My entire community of documented and undocumented people is under attack everywhere, left and right, day after day. And it seems most people think they've done their job simply by liking my article on Facebook, 
sad crying face, maybe even angry face. People think they've done enough by staying caught up on the news so they have something to lament at the dinner table. My life is not a talking point. My life is not something to uplift a liberal agenda. And don't you dare pity me or send me your prayers. Do something. Call your senator or your immigrant phobic family. Show up at an immigrant rights meeting because every day of inaction is another day the status quo prevails. And the status quo is painful even if I have my family intact because it hurts physically, emotionally, mentally, that most citizens don't care enough to give their time and effort to help me and their fellow human beings. Because while most people are going about business as usual, trying to keep up with work deadlines, health goals, and reflecting on their next gratitude post, those of us on the front lines of the Trump administration's attacks are fighting against the limited hours in a day because there's never enough time to work our 60 hour a week jobs and then go to meeting after meeting, plan events, protests, fundraisers, and teach-ins, pouring our energy from what quickly becomes an empty cup. And somehow at the same time, it's still the job of the undocumented community to educate citizens on how our life depends on your voice, your vote, your money, and your willingness to show up. It's not like we enjoy the fact that we need you, but we do. And I'm exhausted from pulling your weight and begging you to act like a citizen in a democracy. And because most people aren't pulling their weight. My mental health is suffering. I need rest too. But right now, I'm afraid that if I don't go to that extra meeting, if I don't share that petition, if I don't convince everyone that this is urgent, then more people will get deported, sometimes sent to their death, and another family will be torn apart. You see, it's urgent for us all the time. And someplace deep inside, you must know it is urgent too. You must. So please, just for a moment, pause. Can you see me? I'm afraid. I'm afraid that in the end, no matter how much I've fought for others, I won't be able to save my own family from deportation. Have you seen the pictures from our borders? Innocent families with young children and elders, tear gassed for seeking refuge. Do you know what is happening across our country? Hardworking immigrants, good parents like mine, locked away like criminals in detention centers. Young children separated from their parents in these terrible tent camps, exposed to abuse, and dying from dehydration and untreated infections? Do you see a war? Do you see at least a semblance to concentration camps? Can you feel your own heart telling you it is urgent? Please listen to your heart not just for me or for the undocumented community, but for your own humanity. Please, it's urgent. Vacía y sola sin haber hecho lo suficiente. Que en la reseca muerte no me encuentre. Vacía.
vacía y sola sin haber hecho lo suficiente. Solo le pido a Dios que lo injusto no me sea indiferente, que no me abofete en la otra mejilla después que una Hi all, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Victor Galvan. I am a undocu monolo monologuist with Modus Theater. Uh, grew up here in Denver, Colorado, and um, just wanna dedicate um, my monologue tonight to uh, my siblings, um, my, my younger siblings, um, Claudia, Silvia, who are making their way here from Mexico. Even though they're United States citizens, they have felt the 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 brunt of what it is to have a, a been separated from their family and um even having to migrate as um immigrate as citizens um my sister claudia just arrived in new mexico uh, two weeks ago and um uh, my heart and my story will go out to her thank you I am a 29-year-old DACA recipient who has lived in Colorado since I was eight months old, long enough to see four different names on the Broncos stadium. My dream has always, I'm sorry, my dream has always been that I would become a citizen and then eventually serve my country as a congressional representative. But right now, the whole idea of dreams feels like a forgotten luxury and to be honest, I'm scared. I'm scared that I'll be kicked out of the country that I, I lived my entire life. And I'm afraid that if I'm deported, my roots may not take to the place they send me. This is not easy to admit because I'm an immigrant rights leader and my battle cry is and has always been that I'm undocumented and unafraid. But every few months, there's another announcement from the Attorney General or the Department of Justice. And yet another attack on the undocumented community. The phone just keeps ringing, off, ringing in my office with terrified people seeking help. Not long ago, this father was picked up at his home under an order of removal in Colorado. And within 36 hours before we really could organize a resistance, he had been moved to Texas and then to New Mexico. And in New Mexico, they forced him to sign a voluntary departure. I saw the paper that he had signed. It was grotesque. It was completely crumpled. There were scribble lines everywhere. I don't know what they did to him, but he is not the kind of man who would have left his wife and four children without a fight. And looking at that broken signature, I fear that a fight with a few detention guards is exactly what they gave him. The hardest thing is that these deportation and human rights abuses are being done on such a massive level that the individual story starts to bleed into an abyss and each unique case ceases to matter. And it hurts because each one is a very real person with real dreams like me. I'm here, I'm brave, I'm funny, I care. Is it okay to tear me out of my bed, away from my family in the middle of the night? Are you gonna believe that I'm scum that doesn't deserve compassion? When I was a kid growing up here in Colorado, I was told you can be anything that you want to be 
if you work hard enough. Dream. Dream big. What they didn't tell me was that there's an immigration checkpoint at the gates to fantasy land. I'm trying not to let my hopes and dreams fizzle away with the attacks from the current administration because I'm afraid that there are fights we have yet to see that are far scarier and even more effective and more well-funded even than this. So I'm going to share a political anecdote that has kept me going. During the 2018 election, my work was to get out the vote. It was hard. People of color were afraid to vote and thought that their vote wouldn't count, that they'd be disenfranchised. We were watching in the news the situation like in Georgia, where the Secretary of State, who was running for governor, literally took half a million people off the rolls. And yet, here in Colorado, we were able to turn out people, and especially Latinos, and that made all the difference locally and across the country with an unprecedented number of people of color and women in office. That shift in representation is important because it shows that we're changing things if we actually raise our voice, if we actually come out and say what flew before us the status quo doesn't fly anymore, right? If you shut doors in our faces, we'll pry them open ourselves. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had nothing in the way of media or money when she took on a 10-term incumbent congressman. She ran her campaign out of the restaurant where she waited tables. A woman whose mother cleaned houses and drove a school bus. But she won on a platform of Medicare for All, federal job guaranteeing a Green New Deal free public college, a 70% marginal tax on incomes over $10 million, criminal justice reform, and get this, abolishing U.S. immigration and customs enforcement. A young woman of color from the Bronx playing a rich man's game. The odds stacked against her. She beat her chest and said, yeah, I'm going to do this. This is what inspires me because that's our story. That's my story. You tell me that I can't and I will anyway. I don't care what you think or that the system is rigged against us. When you tell me to dream big, I take that to heart. And that's what I think America is supposed to be about. And I'm worth it. I do matter. My name is Victor Uriel Galvan Ramirez. I'm undocumented and afraid but I'm not giving up and you can write me in for Congress. Yo tengo tantos hermanos que no los puedo contar en el valle la montaña en la pampa y en el mar cada cual con sus trabajos con sus sueños cada cual con la esperanza delante con los recuerdos detrás yo tengo tantos hermanos que no los puedo contar Gente de mano caliente, por eso de la amistad. Con un lloro para llorarlo, con un rezo para rezar. Con un horizonte abierto que siempre va más allá. Y esa fuerza para buscarlo, con tesón y voluntad. Cuando parece más cerca es cuando se aleja más. Yo tengo tantos hermanos que no los puedo contar. Y así seguimos andando, curtidos de soledad. Y en nosotros nuestros muertos, pa' que nadie quede atrás. 
Yo tengo tantos hermanos que no los puedo contar y una novia muy hermosa que se llama Libertad. Hi everyone, my name is Natalia Molina. I'm a professor at USC in American Studies and Ethnicity. I have to say, I don't usually mind going last, but after listening to all the monologues, it's a little difficult. Um, I'm, I'm feeling what you're feeling. I'm not immune to it just because we're supposed to be reading the monologues tonight. I'm angry, I'm sad. And I'm connecting it to stories like this week about the alleged hyster hysterectomies in Georgia. I was interviewed about it and the interviewer asked, how, um, how do you think this happened? How is this allowed to happen? I said, you know, the human rights are being violated. Why? Because they're not seen as humans. So I hope the stories that we bring to you tonight um, will help you serve as tools for you to share with others so that we can start to see and document it more as humans and we can end this injustice. I was just a kid when I realized what being undocumented meant. At age eight, I started going to work with my dad so I could help him rebuild the entire outside of other people's homes, all the while while not really having a home of our own. I would help my dad research what to charge and work out all the math. For example, I would discover that for one given job, contractors would charge $20,000. But my dad had been screwed over so many times that he would only charge $15,000. Clients would see his strength in Spanish, his lack of English, and doctors Undoc undocumented status and give him about $10,000. And that is who my father believed he was. Half the man I thought he was, half the value of others. I witnessed as my mother would leave for an entire 72 hours to take care of someone else's family. She was lured with the promise of being paid over $300 for the weekend. But when she would come back with only $100 in her pocket, $100 that she saw as a blessing, $100 that I saw as an attack on our family. All those rich families saw little value in everything my mom did. They would take her away only to use her and spit her out. The money they paid was barely enough for food on the table. It didn't cover the worry my mom had because she couldn't be home to take care of us when we were sick, help us with homework, comfort us when we returned to an empty house. One hundred dollars for a whole weekend away from her family. Like she was worthless. But don't you understand? She was priceless to, to me. While spending my weekends without my mom as she cared for other people's children and spending those weekends working for my dad for free so he wouldn't lose money for the privilege of building a home for someone else's family and witnessing this over and over and over again, I began to think that I wasn't worth much either. Despite the fact that I'd been recognized at school as gifted and talented, despite the fact that I was a math whiz and learned English, a completely unknown language in less than a year, and that I was an engaged student, despite the fact I was a precocious worship leader at my church, I let those weekends of feeling worthless affect me. I began making jokes rather than making plans for my future, playing games, 
rather than paying attention. Chasing girls rather than chasing my dreams. And like all self-fulfilling prophecies, I got to the point where my grades reflected what society said my parents and I were, half-priced human beings. But luckily, I had a teacher named Ms. Kovacic who worked hard to remind me of my value and helped convince me that what this society was telling me and my family was wrong. With her support and that of many others, I got myself out of that pit of self-depreciation, past the insecurities, past the hate, past the negativity, past that half version of me into a good college and into a position where I am now an educator who teaches math. And like my mentors, I teach young children their value because all children are valuable, just as you and I are valuable. As a teacher, I can't help myself. Let me take you to school for a few moments. I hope you're good with that. Let's start off with a little math lesson. My father is one man, one of the hardest workers I know. My mother is one woman, one of the strongest and most compassionate individuals in my life. My sister is one daughter, a brat, but a lovable one and an American citizen. I'm one son, half of this country and half of Chile. And we are four whole beautiful, beautiful gifts, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Not the half priced individuals that society has attempted to make us. Moving to applied math and economics. If this country continues to deport the undocumented community, it is missing out on courageous, strong, intelligent, family loving, hard working people of great value. And that is not only our loss, it is your loss to miss out on us, not to mention the billions in taxes we bring in every year, which is billions more than large corporations are paying. Lastly, moving beyond math to ethics, paying an undocumented person half the value for their life's work, extracting all you can get to build your homes and take care of your families, and then deporting them as if they had not brought value is not just mathematically flawed. It is also an American math story problem gone wrong. It is criminal to treat us as subservient and less desirable. I am living in this country undocumented, teaching your children, supporting them, engaging their minds in math and in their dreams. I'm 100% here and 100% committed to this country in which I was raised. This country that constantly seeks to spit me out. Lose me and you lose my value. Not just the money I pay in taxes and the money I pay into social security that I will never benefit from, but you lose my ability to inspire, connect and engage. You lose my ability to bring an impact and you lose the knowledge I bring to my students who are your children. This country would be foolish to lose me, deport me, deport me, but in the end, it's your loss. When the night has come And the land is dark Y la luna es la luz 
que brilla ante mí. Miedo no, no tendré. Oh, I won't be asustaré. Just as long as you stand, stand by me. And darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, oh, oh stand by me. Junto a mí, junto a mí. Y aunque las montañas o el cielo caigan, no voy a preocuparme porque sé que tú estás junto a mí. No lloraré, no lloraré, no, I won't shed a tear porque sé que tú estás junto a mí. And darling, darling, stand by me, oh, 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 stand by me, stand by me, stand by me. Thank you so much, Elisa Garcia, for gracing us with the power of song. Uh, it's beautiful. Thank you. Before we go on, a uh, brief poll will show up on your Zoom screen, if you're watching on Zoom, about how you would measure your experience. Take a moment to submit your response. And I would pause for a longer awkward silence, but I won't. <laughs> so go ahead and do that. And now I would like to ask our, our two distinguished authors and historians to share with us. Um, you read two monologues from, from undocumented people. What impacted you the most when reading aloud the modus monologue you read today? I'll go ahead and start. You know, I, I can talk about some of the history of some of these categories, you know, like when um, he talks about his mom and that she did this labor for, you know, such a, a pittance that barely put food on the table. And in my own classes, I talk about that as, you know, in a very academic way, right? Very immigrants do the social reproduction. <laughs> Uh, in our country, uh, or they do, you know, they help us with our social reproductive labor in terms of domestic work, housekeeping work. But when you read it as his story, and you remember that those uh, workers have families of their own, and it's personalized in that way, it just it really cuts to the bone. And then with the first story where he talked about being stopped by the police. You know, again, we, we know this whole history of uh, policing of young men of color, African-American men, Latino men. Um, but, you know, I thought of my nephew who was stopped when he was young. You know, it didn't matter he was an American citizen and it didn't even matter that he's light skinned. He lives in a Latino neighborhood and it showed us how not just bodies are racialized, but spaces and there's dismissed as, um, as criminal places and places that have to be monitored. And we know that when young people are stopped like that, their uh, information is often entered into a database, uh, therefore putting them at the crosshairs of that uh, policing system. So just everything about it was both personal and political and just overall touching. Thanks. Um, I guess one of the things that I was reflecting on a lot when I was reading Tanya's story and also listening to the others is the arbitrary nature of citizenship um, and 
how throughout this country's history, it has um, decided that some people are worthy of citizenship and some people are not. And that the basis on, and I mean, every country does this, and the basis upon which this is done has changed over time, um, but has always been arbitrary and has been a way of creating different castes, really, of people, different with people with different um, legal rights. And how ironic it is that we, when we tell the story of American history, we tell it as the story of constant progress. And we've, uh, you know, maybe at the beginning, we didn't give rights to everybody, but we've expanded and expanded until now we give rights to everybody. But in fact, now we still divide the population arbitrarily into different castes of people with different rights and um, choose arbitrary, an arbitrary basis on which to decide that some people are worthy of rights and others are not, or that there's different levels of rights that, that different people are worthy of. Um, and I was also struck by something in Tanya's story um, about how hard she tried to prove that she was worthy, um, but that even if she had not been a top student and gotten into a good college um, and done all the wonderful things that she's done, that, that you don't have to do all those things to be deserving of rights. Everybody deserves rights, even if they aren't at the top of their class and the, the most motivated uh, and the highest achiever. Um, and how much people who are undocumented feel this obligation that to be worthy of rights, they have to reach this, this height that, that other people um, aren't held to uh, in order to be deserving of rights. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, thank you both. Uh, at this point, we actually usually ask the monologues whose stories were read by a guest reader to say something about the impact of having their story read aloud by another. And um, uh, Alejandro Fuentes Mena, whose story was read by uh, Professor Molina, is currently in a class himself required for his master's degree. So you all just get to hear from me. Um, and thank you so much to Professor Chomsky for reading my monologue. Uh, I think whenever I hear my story read aloud, it, it sort of makes it just incredibly real. I think when I wrote it and when I hear myself read it, it it's like, oh yeah, like I guess I lived through that. Um, and then I hear it and I'm like, ooh, like that sounds terrible. And I, I shouldn't have to feel that way. I shouldn't have to be so angry. And, you know, it, it just, it makes me think about all of the people who do have stories similar to mine or other stories of, of oppression under, under immigration policies and how sometimes we just are made to feel like this is normal, like it's normal to, to be angry all the time when really it's not. But thank you, thank you. Uh, before we hear actually from Victor and Armando, I also want to go back to Professor Molina and Professor Chomsky to reflect on the stories that, that we've heard from actually the perspective of your research. And because this is part of the One Book, One Boulder project about race, I'd like to ask specifically about uh, immigration in relationship to racism. And either of you can begin. Should I, I like, oh, oh, go ahead. I appreciated the line where he talked about his teacher, uh, Ms. Kovacic. And it's a reminder that we can all be allies despite where, where our racial and ethnic identity. Um, I think so many times when people ask for rights, uh, groups in power think that means giving up their power or giving up their rights in some way. And yet we hear in this story that a teacher is reaching out to him and making a bond across a racial and ethnic color line. But the name Kovacic is also, I looked it up, and it's um, a Croatian, Slovenian name, Hungarian, Serbian. 
And it also reminds me of all the Southern and Eastern European groups that when they entered this country in the late 19th century, early 20th century, were seen as not quite white. They were seen as very low in the white racial hierarchy. And they were treated with discrimination, you know, the Irish, Italians, Jews. And so I also wonder if Ms. Kovacic was willing to reach out because she could relate her own family history connected to this other understanding of discrimination. And so it's a reminder that we can work together. Um, I was also interested, just like Alvi mentioned in relation to your monologue, this notion where he talks about, you know, um, is, isn't this supposed to be the American dream? And you know, he's finding out that's not the reality. And I think we have this idea that if we just pull up from our bootstraps hard enough, we will get there. But that doesn't really get at these histories of discrimination or the ways in which these immigrants are supposed to come, do the work, and leave. In the 1910s and 20s, we called them birds of passage. And that was the argument for not putting them on any kind of uh, quota system that capped their immigration levels, but they were supposed to come here, do the work, and like birds of passage would leave when the work was done. We, that changed in the 30s with the depression, and we actually had repatriation and deportation programs. And those programs weren't even officially done when we initiated a guest worker program in 1942 because of World War II shortages to 1964 where once again, we invited Mexican workers back to do the work, but not to stay. And we keep seeing the, sick, the same cycle and we're seeing it now. And I'm coming to you from California where we have over 28 wildfires. And I actually almost cried the other day when I went outside to walk our dogs and realized I'd sent my son out in the smoke just the day before. And then I thought of all the farm workers who are out there for hours, because even for five minutes, and even though we aren't even in an evacuation zone, I was choking. And so again, these stories will help us see the humanity in their lives and hopefully connect and make a change. So I wanted to say something, I'm a historian, so I can't help trying to talk about history. Um, about just how deeply intertwined race and immigration have been for this country's entire history. That is, um, the idea that some people belong in this country and others do not belong in this country um, has always been racialized. And if you go all the way back to the, uh, well, to the beginnings of British colonialism, the idea that this was to be a white land and non-white people, Native Americans, um, were to be expelled from the lands where whites were settling and people from Africa uh, were to be enslaved by white people in these lands that white people were settling. Um, and that then when these white colonists rebelled and um, formed their own country at the end of the 1700s, um, they very explicitly stated that it was to be a white country and they wanted immigration, white immigration, only white people could be citizens. Um, and it was explicitly there in the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution that, that they were forming a white country. So immigrants by definition were white people because only white people could be citizens of the country. And it's really not until after the Civil War when citizenship by birth is created and citizenship is extended first beyond white people to people of African nativity and African descent are allowed to be citizens and citizenship by birth is created by the 14th Amendment. Um, that is anyone who is born here, regardless of race, can be a citizen. That's when anti-immigrant sentiments and movements began because now people who cross the border or any border, sea or land border, would be, their children would be citizens regardless of race. That's what citizenship by birth 
did. It opened up citizenship racially. But Congress did not want that result of citizenship by birth and thus started restricting immigration of all people who were not white. And we're still really, um, there, um, as Natalia mentioned, um, Mexicans were not considered immigrants. That is, uh, the solution for Mexicans, because their labor was needed, is that they would be treated as guest workers and deported before they could have children here. So this is the logic of immigration and citizenship that the country was founded on, that it was ruled by, um, and that it continues to be ruled by. That is, some immigrants are wanted and some immigrants are unwanted. And the enormously complex uh, accretion of immigration laws over the years has kept um, this, this racial ideology. And so that when President Trump says, uh, we don't need immigrants from those expletive countries. We need immigrants from places like Norway. Um, it sounds terrible to our ears today, but really he's just articulating what our immigration law has always done. And treating Mexicans as guest workers, as deportable workers, um, or as undocumented, a new category that was essentially invented to justify the deportation of Mexicans after 1965, um, that we cannot separate our, our country's history of racism from its history of whitening the population through its immigration laws, and in particular relevance uh, to us here tonight, its treatment of people from Latin America, beginning with Mexicans and expanding to the rest of Latin America as immigrants from the rest of Latin America started to come as some kind of essentially unwanted people or people who are only good for coming here to work and then going home without gaining citizenship. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing your expertise and insights about how our history can teach us so much um, about the intersections of immigration and race today. Um, Victor and Armando, do you want to share any reflections after having heard from our guest readers and or actions you suggest before we close the official presentation and begin the Q&A? Yeah, I would like to say thank you to Professor Chomsky and Professor Molina. Um, I think there's a, a lot of knowledge and I feel like I just got a refresher of history. So I, I thank you for that. That was great. But uh, also thank you for sharing, uh, reading the stories. I think we just met today and by you stepping into the shoes of the stories that you read, I feel like we're connected. So I hope that everybody that's here and got to listen to it felt, felt connected too. And also the music was a great touch. So thank you for that. Thanks, Armando. What about you, Victor? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to echo um, just the gratitude to, to Professor Molina and uh, Professor Chomsky for your time and, and, um, and again, for stepping in our shoes. Um, you know, one thing that I would love to, to talk to the audience about is, you know, um, our elections. You know, a, a part of my story is about voting, you know, and, and being heard. Um, to me, you know, my, my current work right now is to get out the vote, um, here in the, the, the Denver metro area. Um, and, um, I couldn't stress enough how important this election is. I'd have to say, you know, for me and my generation, it's probably the most important election in our generation. Um, I, I urge you, you know, if you have not made up your mind, you know, on the election to, to look into your candidates um, up and down the ballot. Um, you don't know how important it is. Um, well, I'm sure you do know how important it is, but I just want to stress the importance of, of voting for every single person that you have the opportunity to vote for, because that's one more person who's rep representative of our community and has, you know, one more person telling them that immigrant rights matter, 
you know, that, that undocumented people matter and that we have to have a voice and um, that we're here. Um, now more than ever, our community is, is feeling the economic pressure of the current situation under COVID-19. And of course, you know, the federal government neglecting to provide stimulus um, checks to undocumented people. Um, we're, we're about to see, you know, a, 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 a depression in which we see people starting to make the choice between paying rent and, um, and feeding their children or, or eating themselves, you know, um, feeding themselves. And, you know, to me, that's, that's a tragedy because these are the same people who are, are working so hard to maintain, you know, the status quo to make sure that, that the, the day by day things are happening, whether it's to feed the United States um, through our farm workers, whether it's to tend to, to the tourism industry, whether it's to erect our buildings and um, even the students who are in our classrooms, um, please, please get out and vote because we, we, we need to reflect the importance of every single person in this country um, down to the very lowly, you know, farm worker. And um, yeah, just want to thank you all for participating and for, for listening to our stories. Thank you, Victor and Armando. We are now at the end of the official One Book, One Boulder programming, though we really encourage you all to stay for another 15-ish minutes to ask questions of our esteemed guest speakers about the intersection of immigration, race, economics, and history. Um, at this moment, though, please take a second to answer a brief poll on the post-performance conversation that you will see pop up on your screen. And thank you so much to our modus monologist for sharing your stories of injustice and resilience. Thank you to Professor Chomsky and Professor Molina for bringing your expertise on these complex systems. And thank you to our audience for listening deeply and practicing that courageous empathy and civic hospitality. Uh, thank you to Boulder Library for hosting us and engaging our community on a thoughtful conversation on racism. If you haven't yet read the, the One Book, One Boulder book selection, so you want to talk about race by Ijoma Alul, read it today and check out the exciting programs happening through the library this fall, including another performance by Modus Theaters, Just Us, Stories from the Front Lines of the Criminal Justice System. And visit our website to find out how you can share these stories, as well as more information about Modus's Shoebox Stories podcasts with guest readers like feminist icon Gloria Steinem, actor John Lithgow, Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors, and police chief R. Acevedo from Houston. In the chat, you will now find a link to a document with all of these details, as well as other action items and even detailed information about how immigrants are key to the fight against COVID-19. Thank you for welcoming us into your space today. Um, if you are able, please consider donating to Modus Theater so that we can continue to share our stories far and wide. And now uh, I would like to begin this audience Q&A, so we hope you'll stick around. Uh, please use the chat or the Q&A function on the Zoom to type in your questions. And if you're on Facebook Live, you can type your question into the comments and it'll be rerouted to me. Um, I'll just go ahead and start reading aloud some audience questions. And for our speakers, any of you can, can take any question posed. Um, but if something is directed towards a specific person, I will let you know. So I'm going to start looking into the chat and see if anyone has some, some questions. But as you begin writing, um, I would just like to reiterate that this is an amazing conversation, an amazing opportunity uh, to talk about these, these intersections that are really driving our community. So looking forward to seeing some questions from the audience. Right now, one question says, I am interested in hearing more from Dr. Molina on her understanding of relational formations of race and why it is important to use a relational intersectional approach and not a comparative approach. Thank you for that question. Uh, comparative history is very important. Uh, comparative history would be, for example, to show 
uh, why in the civil rights movement, you know, we just had the 50th anniversary of the Chicano moratorium in Los Angeles. And what people talk about is, uh, you know, maybe comparing the Chicano moratorium to African American civil rights movements. A relational approach looks at the way that people can relate to each other's movements. So the Chicano movement learned lessons from what happened during the 1965 Watts uprisings, also in Los Angeles, and the ways that uh, African Americans were struggling for civil rights and looked for ways to reclaim dignity, and they could relate to that movement. And so even though the, the moratorium was five years after the 1965 Watts uprisings, they felt a certain kind of um, uh, you know, kinship, uh, common cause with them. And sometimes those uh, movements aren't even in the same in time or the same in space. So for example, Ms. Kovacic, she may not have any understanding of what it means to be uh, undocumented but she may have an understanding of what it means to be treated as an outsider because of race, because of her family's history, and therefore she can relate. And so relational understanding of race shows our commonalities, even though we may not oh, sorry, path cross in time or space. Professor Chomsky, would you like to add anything before I go to the next question? No, okay. So the next question says, what are some of the ways that you recommend that we hold our local or state officials accountable for their role in protecting our undocumented friends and neighbors? Are there any local organizations that we can get involved with, familiar with a lot of national orgs, but not as many local ones? Does anyone want to answer the question? I also wanna point out that the, um, the fact sheet is now linked in the chat. Yes. Um, yeah, I'd love to take to this question on. Honestly, one of the best ways to, to hold folks accountable is to um, talk to them, right? One thing that I learned earlier on in my organizer uh, organizing is that you can you can build a relationship with your your legislature your your legislators, and hold them accountable. Um, tell them your story as as you know as these stories have affected you and also. Um, develop your own immigrant story. You know, most of us um, have relatives that were not born here and can speak to that immigrant story. Um, and I think that's one of the most important things that you can do to be an advocate for immigrant rights is to connect with your own immigrant history. Um, apart from that, um, get to know the laws and how they affect immigrants um, locally. Um, if you are able to, to talk to legislators about the impact of, of legislation on the immigrant community, um, we can all be better for it um, if we, we see, you know, measures passed or stopped when they're harmful. Um, above all else, you know, befriend immigrants. <laughs> um, it's important to be a part of, of, of the community. So, you know, as, as we have, you know, refugees coming into this country, as we, you know, we see, you know, the Muslim community, the black community, the, you know, um, um, under attack, please reach out to them. Um, you know, and here in Denver and in Colorado, um, majority of the immigrant community is, is Latino. And I think um, for the most part, there is a huge community for them, but for others, there have been um, lack of resources and and places to really reflect their identity. So supporting, you know, ways for those cultures to be celebrated is also important. So there are many, many ways, you know, and I can go on, but more than anything is just get involved. Um, in terms of organizations, the Colorado Immigrant Rights Coalition is a great organization to get involved with. Um, they have a list of, of nonprofits across the state that you can get involved with, um, local organizations in Boulder and in Denver. Um, I'm a part of an organization that um, looks at its work through an immigrant lens, um, United for a New Economy, um, and we'd be more than happy to have you as a volunteer. So um, yeah, any of those organizations, um, please reach out, um, talk to an organizer, tell them you want to get involved, and volunteer. Thanks, Victor. 
Um, so um, I just wanted to add something and I can't speak to the Denver Boulder area specifically because I'm far across the country, but um, you know, most immigration policy is made at the federal level and they're probably the most important thing we can do is vote right now. But some immigration policy is made at the state and local level. And um, I know some of the struggles we're working on in Massachusetts are for three types of legislation that some states have managed to pass. And I don't know what the situation is in Colorado, um, but we have not in Massachusetts. We like to think of ourselves as a liberal state, yet we have failed to pass the three key pieces of state level immigrant rights legislation. Um, one of those is driver's licenses for people who are undocumented. Several states in the United States allow people who are undocumented to obtain driver's licenses. Massachusetts doesn't. Um, two is in-state tuition. Students who are undocumented, are they able to pay in-state tuition um, if they attend an institution of higher learning in the state? Um, I teach at a state university. so. Um, we have different rates for in-state and out-of-state students and um, students who are undocumented are not considered residents of the state either but that is something that's decided by each state so massachusetts could do that and um, that's another thing um, and finally uh, sanctuary policies what kind of laws does the state pass in terms of their own the state and other localities, uh, cities and counties, pass regarding their own um, police forces collaboration and enforcement of immigration law. That is, local state and local police forces are not obligated to enforce federal immigration law. Um, whether they do, whether they do or not, is up to state and local um, law. So those are. Those are three things that, that we can talk about doing at a much more local level, legally. Thank you so much for highlighting that. Um, and I think it is important to get involved locally. The Colorado Immigrant Rights Coalition does have uh, specific policies that they will be working on locally. And you can find that also on their, their website and, and more information on our fact sheet. Uh, there are a few more questions in the, in the Q&A function. One of them says, if anyone can speak to this, I am very concerned for trans women of color in detention centers. How can we bring the many intersections into the conversation? This, um, thank you so much for asking that question. I think um, as we look at the, the right, the the population of immigrants, you know, you also have to look at the cross sections in which, you know, harm is being done to our communities. And absolutely, you know, when we have gay, uh, um, gay, trans, um, lesbian, um, queer, um, undocumented folks, they in fact are suffering, you know, um, uh, doubly because of their identities. And um, especially in detention centers where they um, are forced to, to, to be in cells with, you know, people of the the of of the wrong gender, um, the the gender that they're assigned, right, and not the gender that they reflect, and um, you know, for 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 many people in in our community, um, this has been brought up as a huge problem, um, not only because these people are not these folks are not being um, one treated medically um, appropriately, um, but also they're 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 being put either in solitary confinement as a resolution to um, to um, the problem, which is um, not being treated as the, the gender that they're reflecting. Um, so there's a lot that, that can be done. One is to bring that intersection together and bring in the LGBTQ community uh, on this problem that um, gay and lesbian and trans folks are feeling that pressure in detention centers. Um, also getting getting involved with groups that, that, that tr try to keep you know, detention centers and, and ICE officials accountable for for um, the human rights violations. So groups like um, the Colorado Immigrant Rights Coalition, American Friends Service Committee um, on the local level, um, um, Colorado People, People's Alliance. Um, these are groups that you can go to um, and talk to about how you can specifically advocate for, for trans undocumented folks in detention.
If there are no other thoughts, I can certainly go to the next question, um, which is about sanctuary. I know, Avi, you were mentioning sanctuary cities. And the question says, I think that last week I saw that in the Denver Post uh, said the 900 immigrants were being deported from Denver, despite that Denver is a sanctuary city. How did this happen? And um, both of our professors are speaking here uh, from out of Colorado, but perhaps you can speak more broadly to sanctuary as a whole. Yeah, um, so uh, sanctuary is actually a very limited concept. It does not prevent people from getting deported. Um, and again, it's because of this weird intersection be between federal and state law. Um, all that a state can do in terms of state law is control what the state level institutions, how much they collaborate with and turn information and turn people over to federal authorities. Um, so a state that is a sanctuary state or a city that is a sanctuary city puts limits on how much local authorities can collaborate with ICE, with Immigration Customs Enforcement. But ICE enforces federal law, they're their own police force, um, and states cannot control or stop ICE from acting within their states. They can only control what their local, how much their local authorities um, can be used to enforce these federal laws, but they can't stop federal officials from enforcing federal laws. So sanctuary cities and states cannot prevent people from getting deported. They can only refuse to collaborate. Thank you. Professor Molina, do you wanna add anything to that? No? Thanks. Um, there is one last question and, or actually there's two questions, but we'll start with this one. Uh, hearing these stories, it has made me realize how brave immigrants are how are you able to gather so much courage just to even live in this country? I can't imagine the constant feelings of anxiety. It would make me just want to shut down. Victor or Armando. Yeah, I can start with this one. So uh, thank you, Daniel, for the great question. And the truth is that, you know, like I see myself as a survivor and I know a lot of us who come from other countries, you know, we have to give up our families. We have to give up our friends in those countries because, you know, either we weren't safe, there wasn't enough money. There's a reason why we're here, you know, and it was a big struggle to get here. And we're here and we're trying our best to be the best, you know, people we could be for our communities. But yeah, when it comes down to it, we live under a lot of anxiety. Uh, for example, for myself, I was one of the students who couldn't go to school anymore because I wasn't allowed in-state tuition. So it's, it was like a roadblock in my, in my journey through life. Um, also before DACA and not having a license and having to go places, having to work and driving, it, it, every time I got in the car, was, I, was, I was a nervous wreck because it meant like if I saw a cop, I was like, okay, I'm gonna get pulled over uh, and then, you know, I could be deported just for a simple traffic violation. So um, living the immigrant life is, it's like being on a roller coaster. So you have your highs, you know, and you're here and you, you have food, you have running water, you have uh, good memories here, but also the lows come and hit you hard, which is that like not being able to see family, um, having family in other countries who pass away and you don't even get to be at their funeral. So it, we go through a lot of sacrifices, but it's all with the hope that we can change things and we could be better as a nation, you know, and we can live to our values. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what keeps me going that uh, I see the future and I know we could get there together, but it's going to take all of us, you know, not just us here. Um, it, it'll take all of us to get there. Thank you, Armando. Victor, did you want to add something? I think I can leave it at that. Armando said it very well. Yeah. Um, I think we can probably close out with this last question. 
uh, it's, it's asking a very big question, so maybe we can just interpret it as we will for tonight and, and answer briefly. How would you define your own radical politics? Whoever wants to take it away. <laughs> I can start. I can start by saying that it's not about radical politics because we, um, as a nation, tend to get drawn into uh, making everything about politics. But it's more about what's right and wrong. So if you know, feeding the hungry, uh, giving insurance to the people who are sick, if that seems as radical, I, I, I don't really know what to say to that. That in my view, just seems like common sense. So instead of uh, having a radical politics, I'm more for common sense politics. Does that... Okay, um, I know I said we would close up, but there was another question. So, okay, for real, for real, this is the last question. Um, and only because I like it, it says, can you speak to the intersection between the Black Lives Matter movement and the ongoing and historic racism and discrimination towards immigrant and undocumented people? I'll go ahead and take a stab at that question. So, you know, this week, as I mentioned in the introduction, we heard this terrible news uh, coming out of Georgia that allegedly women are being uh, you know, being forced to have hysterectomies in detention centers. And the way to and you know, and so when, you know, the way to think about that, the response to that is also to see how these uh, reproductive politics, these reproductive horror stories in our history have not only affected undocumented and Latinas, but also African-American women, Native American women. Because race is a category. Race is a category that is very much about power. Race is very much about, you know, who, you know, we, we want to uh, do our labor and not see their humanity, who we don't want to recognize their, their full rights. And so uh, when, I was at, when I was interviewed uh, about this, you know, the question was, were you surprised? And it was like, yes, but no. <laughs> Right, because we have these, this long history of seeing people less than human. So if we look at the way that that has affected the African-American community, we go back, go back to slavery, how eugenics was very much about scientific understandings about race, scientific uh, rationale that said it was okay to enslave people, uh, the way that we needed to prove that with science by experimenting on them, on women's reproductive organs, um, on, on brains, on measuring skulls. Uh, while people were alive after they passed. Uh, for immigrants, we, we see this also uh, as they're immigrating Southern Eastern Europeans, seeing them as less than. And you know, whole, whole studies were done on Jew, Jewish people as inferior. For Latinas, we saw them as excessive breeders. Um, and that was our rationale also for deporting them uh, in the 1930s. Even though in the 1910s and 20s, we had extended Americanization programs to them to show that uh, Mexican laborers were safe laborers. Um, and so we keep seeing this pattern. And it's not just about one, one racialized group, one race or ethnicity. It's about what race means. And if race means that it's easier to deny people human rights so that we don't have to pay them <clears throat> a living wage, give them health care, give them PPP, give them you know, personal protective equipment either, or respect their rights when they're in detention because we blame it on them saying, well, they came here. Well, you know, then that's how we keep getting into this, these situations. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I just wanna thank everyone for coming and, and for asking all of these amazing questions and to our monologuists and historians for your insights. Um, I hope you will take a, a brief moment to answer a poll question about the Q&A. And um, while you do that, I just want to share with you that you will get an email from Zoom with a survey link so you can share more feedback with Modus Theater and the Public Library, um, as well as uh, the fact sheet once again. And um, eventually we will have this recording out on YouTube so you can find it and share it with your friends. 
I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much for coming today. And thank you for holding our stories close. That's it for today. Bye. If you could just for a moment Take a walk in my shoes Feel the weight of my burden